Hello, it's nice to be with you today. Before I get deeply into the clock, I'd like to set the stage for you. Uh, we're in the middle of open house here at the school, so you'll hear a little background noise, and uh, you may occasionally hear something that sounds like a diesel train going through the department. There's a fur our clock. You'll receive two items. One item will be a floppy disk of the size that you need, which contains the clock programs on it. The second item will be a pigtail for your printer port. It'll look like an ordinary printer cord on one end, and on the other end there will be four lines color-coded in two pairs. Each color-coded pair of lines is to be attached to a light monitoring a lane on your racetrack. The lights, then you'll be going through the processes that I'll go through now in order to set up a race. I want to back up just a moment before race setup though and show you what you'll want to do when you first receive the programs. Uh, the programs are designed to be as user friendly as we can make them and every time we think of a, of a way to make them friendlier why well, we'll we'll improve the programs but as they come to you now they're menu driven and you activate them from the operating system prompt on your computer right after you've bootstrapped so you will uh, uh, see displayed on the screen the main menu which drives the system the first option on the menu is the first thing that you'll want to do it's the calibrate option this timer adapts itself to the internal speed of the computer processor that it's running on. And this calibration routine checks to see just how precise the timer is going to be on this particular computer system. As you move from system to system, you'll need to recalibrate using this menu option. When calibration is finished, you will see a number displayed on the screen that will tell you how many beats per second you will experience if you use the timer on this particular computer. It's up to you to decide whether the processor you're testing is fast enough to do what you want it to do or not. You can expect orders of magnitude of 2500 beats per second on 286 processors with math coprocessors active and on 486's with math coprocessors active, pardon me, you, you can expect a beat rate of 12,000 to 17,000 beats per second. And of course, as the newer processors hit the market, you'll get clocks that are more and more precise. Once you've calibrated the clock, write that calibration number on a slip of paper. You'll need it each time you use the clock with this computer. The second option on this menu is the option to enter the calibration value. When you set up the clock on race day, you'll need to enter the calibration value to activate the clock. A second thing that you'll want to do when you receive the program is before you set up the clock is to check the computer to see if it's emitting any noise that will cause false signals on the system. As computers get older, sometimes the brushes in the motors get noisy and they send out signals that are misinterpreted as light signals coming from your timing devices. There's an option 5 on this menu that's labeled Test Input Ports. You may activate that option. I'll do that now. 
it asks me which port my lights are hooked up to. And I'll demonstrate in a moment what happens if you um, activate the wrong port. But I happen to know that these lights are hooked up to printer port 2. So I'll enter printer port 2. And while I'm visiting with you, this program will cycle for 10 seconds, check out the system, and see if there's any kind of interference noise that might cause a problem. The message has come up on the screen that the 10 sec second test indicates that the line is clear. By pressing enter, I return to the main menu, and now I'm ready to set up the lights. That's option four on this particular menu. When I press option four, I'm asked by the program which printer port the lights are plugged into. And I'm going to give it a wrong answer. I'm going to tell it that my printer port that I'm using is port one. The program believes me and it puts a message up on the screen that says please break the light beam on lane one, which I'll do with one of my high speed racers here, and press the enter key. <clears throat> when I press the enter key, I don't get the message I expect. Instead, the program says that it's looping and it wants to know if there's a problem. That's my signal that I have designated the wrong port for my printer. So I'm going to take that high-speed car out of that light beam and I'm going to answer yes, there's a problem. The program returns me to the menu and gives me the opportunity to select option four to set up the lights again. This time I'm going to tell it the correct port number for the printer cable. That's port number two. Again, the program asks me to break the beam on lane one. Now, I get to select lane one. The program lets me choose the lanes. And I break the, I press the enter key while the beam is broken. The program echoes back on the screen the binary value that it has picked up as the signal sent by the light in lane one. That's just in case any of you are technically oriented and want to know what that binary value is. The instructions say to please break the light beam on lane two. So I'll break the light beam on lane two with my other high speed racer. And I'll press the enter key. And again, a different value is echoed to the screen for my information. And I receive the instruction to please break both beams and press the enter key. When I do that, <coughs> the program will record the setting for a tie race. So now I have established the settings for lane one broken, lane two broken, and tie race. Following the instructions on the screen, I press the enter key, and I get a recommendation from the program that I test my system with that option five, which I've already demonstrated several times, to be sure that there's no noise on the lines. So you might want to do that on race day after you get your clock all set up to be sure that there's no noise on the lines. Now we are set up. The computer has stored its value, the clock is calibrated, and we're ready to race. So I'll ask my able assistant to give me a hand here. If you'll take these two high velocity race cars up to the top of the track, I'll demonstrate how to handle the timer all day during race day. To set up a race, select option three, which is start timer, and wait until the cars are rolling. As they approach the finish line, pressing the enter key will activate the clock. Okay, let's have a race here. I press the enter key, the clock is ready, and it records that the two cars arrived separated by 3.328 seconds. Of course, in the, in the usual derby setting, we'd go to the top of the hill, swap the cars, and have another race. But basically, that's all that's required to run the clock during the days. To return back to the main menu, I have an instruction here to press the enter key after I've recorded the results. The main menu returns. I select option three and wait for another race. As soon as the cars approach the finish line, I press the enter key, the clock is activated, and the race is timed. 
As I mentioned, we've tried to make this clock as user-friendly as we can, and we will continue to improve it as time goes along. A couple of improvements that are on the drawing board are one to record the brackets as race day progresses and print out the brackets or display the performance of a single car on the screen on request and also a modification to estimate the speeds of the two cars as they pass through the lights. If you purchase the clock now any improvements to the clock will be routed to you for the cost of postage and handling.